We could talk about like what actually happens when the chef runs them, but that's it's important, but it's also a little boring, a little dry. Um, so just try and keep you guys as awake as much as possible. The other thing is, so it's 3.41, we have the room until 5. It's up to you guys as like how much further you want to go and keep going. Uh, I can always give you the rest of this deck and you can kind of work on this on your own um, at any point in time. Um, I know there's the Apache keynotes coming up towards the end of the day and things like that. So it's up to you guys. Um, I'll let you drive the class. But this is kind of an important concept, so we at least want to get through this. Um, so <clears throat> we want to talk about node attributes. And so attributes are one of the key defining concepts of Chef. And they're an extremely important aspect when you're writing a recipe or something like that. We already saw attributes when we did the knife node search or the list as well, and we were able to specify the dash A, and we got certain attributes that we wanted back from the search results or from the listing results, right? Um, so we've already talked about a node a bit, so it's any physical, it's anywhere where Chef Client is running and installed, right? Um, when you write a recipe, you can manipulate the node object, right? Because you're running on the node and thus you can interact with the node object itself. Um, so inside of these, um, um, inside of these nodes, they have essentially various components to them, and it's really an object. So think of it in an object-oriented programming type perspective. There's attributes. There's the run list or the methods that I'm actually going to perform, the resources that I'm going to manage, and then the chef environment or the environment that I'm running in, and I haven't talked about environments, and I probably won't talk about environments much, but essentially you can group servers by a common, like, like production servers. You can group it development servers. And then you can isolate them so that you have maybe a certain set of cookbooks you want to run on uh, one environment versus another environment and so forth. You can also pin versions of cookbooks per environment. So you could say production environment always gets Apache 2.1.5 cookbook, but in my lower environments, I can do testing with newer cookbooks as I develop them, and I can make sure that I won't infect production with a cookbook that I don't necessarily want to go to production until I increment the version number in the environment. What would you mean? Your, like the environment you had up earlier, you had a load balancer, an app stack, and then you had like an API system and a database system. Mm -hmm. That whole environment would be one chef environment, or would you have that to would all be one, one chef environment? Okay, and then you, you could have additional things inside of that environment as well. <coughs> How do you specify the differences between those nodes? Is that the attributes or the run list? It's the run list. Okay, essentially, is how you specify the thing. Okay. I was making sure I understand the hierarchy. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Um. So we already talked about this as well. So I'm just going to skip over this. So the Data in the client server model is searchable, right? We've already talked about that. So the syntax, um, so nodes are actually hashes of hashes in, in Ruby syntax, right? Um, and so you just specify if you want the kernel or you want the host name or anything like that, you just specify that. Since it is a, so a Rubyism uh, is that Let's not talk about it right now. <laughs> All right, so there's, there's like three different ways to, specif to write this part in the middle between the brackets, right? So there's double quotes, there's single quotes, and the third way is a Rubyism called uh, symbols or immutable strings. And the third way is you could put colon host name with no quotes means the exact same thing. The immutable strings are faster because they're immutable, right? You're never going to change this string. So therefore, when it's allocated and things like that, it's done in a special way that Ruby actually makes it work faster. Um, there is a debate in the Chef community whether if you should use single quotes or if you should use immutable strings. I won't get into that right now. There's something called Food Critic, which will actually lint 
your chef recipe to make sure like it's syntactically correct and you're doing smart things. Um, and uh, it's not installed in Sublime. It's installed as like a Knight plugin. Gotcha. It's a gem that you actually install. All right. Yeah. Um, so let's open our template. So our index.html.erb, and let's put in some data. So we're going to put in my name is node host name. And then save your file. Now, if you wanted to, if you want to work ahead, or you can uh, do that long listing and get back all of the attributes that are available on the node. And you could put in more stuff here, right? So uptime. Don't put in uptime, and I'll tell you why in a second. So you don't put in uptime because every single time the chef client runs, uptime is different. You're putting this into a template. And thus, every time that the template file is parsed by chef, uptime is different, thus the template changes. And if the template triggers a service restart or something, then you're like always going to be restarting that service or something like that, right? So be careful, like if it's a counter or something like that in your node attributes, be careful where you use it. So save it, upload the recipe or the cookbook, and then run your chef client again. The awesome bit that is you can't see on the screen, you can't see on the recording, um, you actually get a diff of what you changed. So what you deleted, what you added, and so forth. Um, additionally, you, I'll break out of this. So everyone get this far so far? The other thing that you can do, and I know this is an open source conference, so forgive me, but this is kind of cool to see. Um, you can go to Chef Manage, the GUI, and you can go to Reports. And you can actually get a run history. And you'll see all the runs that took place. And if anything changed, you can actually see what changed um, and what was managed and stuff like that. Sorry to like pimp the product. <laughs> um, and so the, this is yours to use. It's like five nodes for free. So play around with it. Keep it as long as you want. We won't care. Uh, so as you're learning Chef and things like that, you can actually continue to use it. So everyone, Chef run complete. Um, the other thing that you can run on the node, you can run OHI. And so this is on your node. This is on your, on, isn't on your local machine. And you'll get back uh, a bunch of data. And so you'll notice. By default, it was able to go out and find out what version of Perl you have installed and what version of Python you had installed. This is obviously like a Red Hat box or something. Since we're using a two-year-old version of uh, You can also specify like various bits of information, so specify the attributes, right? So if you specify OHI hostname, it'll give you back the hostname. Which is similar to uh, the node object, right? That's where all that data comes from. It's from OHI. Um, we already did this. Um, so you should actually go to the home page and you should see my name is whatever your node's name is, web 10 or whatever you guys put, right? Everyone work? Did you figure out your problem of why? But I don't care. You don't care. <laughs> You're right. For now. For now. He's got a weird problem where he can't connect to port 80 on his machine. You're using Ubuntu, right? No, do you CentOS? Do you have a firewall running on CentOS? SE Linux, probably. Or IP tables. So IP tables dash capital L. IP tables has some rules. Let's do service IP tables stop.
Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Multiple layers of firewall. Yeah, that's why I'm using Ubuntu. <laughs> Local firewall. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> it has one, but they don't enable it by default. I know. <laughs> um, so we can actually set these attributes as well, and we can use them and do useful things with them. Um, so we already kind of talked about node attributes. You can also have attributes in cookbooks as well. And these attributes will then end up influencing the node attributes, not influencing, setting the node attributes, right? So say Apache. So we're installing Apache. What if we wanted to find the port Apache listens on? Then we can actually do that through an attribute in a recipe. And when we want to change it, we just need to change the attribute. We don't need to change all of our configuration files. Um, so attributes can also not only be on the node, but as I said, in the cookbooks and recipes. They can also be specified in roles and environments as well. So if there's an attribute that you want to change for a group of servers, then you can do that in a role or an environment. <coughs> so these are the ones that are kind of set automatically in OHI. Um, so when you set an attribute, we're not going to talk about precedence at all. Uh, but essentially, when you get started with Chef, the advice I can give you is always just use default to begin with. There are 15 levels of attribute precedence. And it's changed by this name here. So there's override, there's force override, there's force default, and a whole bunch of other things. By default, just use default. Uh, and then there's a precedent in roles, environments, nodes, and cookbooks as well, of which one wins out there as well. To make it simple, just use default. And then when you need to, you can actually go into overrides and things like that when you get more mature in what you're doing with Shop. Um, so let's open. Our attributes file, so cookbooks, Apache, attributes, default. And just drop that in there file. So everyone got that in the file? Yes? So now go into your index.html.erb. And instead of hello world, you can now drop in the attribute that you just set. Now you notice that you don't say default here, you say node. So when you're setting, you use default. When you're consuming, you use node, right? Make sense? And even though you're inside of a cookbook, like when I first saw this, it didn't necessarily make sense to me. But even though you're inside of a cookbook, you still you use node because the node object is the one that has all of the attributes set on it, right? Um, it's not the cookbook itself. So all of these attributes that you define in the attributes file actually ends up getting pushed onto the node object itself. So save that and then upload your cookbook after you've saved it. And then after you upload your cookbook, what do you do? Run Chef Client. The next thing that we're going to do, which the last thing that we're going to do, is we're going to set up Chef Client to run automatically for you. So we'll do a role to actually do that. I'll show you some other things as well. Um, you shouldn't have to be logging into the box to run Chef Client all the time. Chef Client should run periodically for you. So let me know when you guys got this working. So 
What's interesting, oh, because the case is different. So if your case wasn't the same, in this case it was hello lowercase world, uppercase world, so that actually did make the change. But this chef run should happen successfully. Everyone good? Yep. And then you should verify it's the way that you want it to look. All right? So on your host, um, on your workstation, so run knife, uh, cookbook, site, install, um, chef, client. And this is probably going to complain, yes. So this complains. And the reason why this complains and like we can, uh, we can debate version control systems if we want to, but let's just, we use Git by default, so sorry. Um, this, the nice thing is, is that when you run knife cookbook site install, it actually downloads all the dependencies for you as well. There's another tool called Burke Shelf, uh, so B-E-R-K Shelf, which will actually help you do dependency management as well. Uh, so you can use either one of those tools, but a lot of the stuff in some cases of what we do are hooked very closely into Git at times. Um, so if we do Git init, we're gonna init the repository. If we run this command again, it's going to complain. So we actually have to do a commit. So we do git add star And then git, oh, is git not installed on your workstation? Not on Windows. Shit. Oh, on his Windows. Yeah. God, Windows users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so the other way that you can do this is you can do um, knife cookbook site download. The problem if you do this is it doesn't download any dependencies. And the Chef Client Cookbook actually has several dependencies that you need. So um, it's not the most, um, what's the word, uh, optimal way of doing it. So uh, inside of this, one thing I didn't uh, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, there's this file called metadata.rb, and this metadata.rb shows you a diff various things. Um, so it has the name, uh, the maintainer, the email, what license that this cookbook's under. It also has the version number. So as you're making changes to the cookbooks. You should be bumping this version number, and then you upload it to the Chef server, and then it's got different versions that it actually maintains for you. So you can actually use different versions on different servers and different environments and things like that if you want to. The other thing that you'll notice inside of here is that it's got dependencies. So this depends upon... Um, this depends upon cron, and it also depends upon log rotate. I thought it depended upon um, Windows as well, but maybe not in this version. So what we can actually do, since we don't, maybe we don't want to use git, we can download cron. So the first command is um, knife site cookbook download chef client. Knife cookbook site download cron, and then knife cookbook site download log rotate.
And I assume you all know how to, you're at a free and open source conference. I hope you would know how to extract a tarball. <laughs> oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Oh, I made a bad mistake. So I'm in the wrong directory and I downloaded this stuff. Oh well. So you want these you want these extracted tarballs into your cookbooks directory? I was in my chef client cookbook <laughs> and I extracted these, so I need to remove them. So you want your cookbooks directory to look like this now. So you want Chef Client, Apache, Cron, and Log Rotate, and plus these other things that we put in there by default. And after you do that, if you do knife cookbook upload dash all, or I cheat and do star, which is not the best way to do it because you get errors like this. Uh, if you do dash all, then it'll actually, like this, it'll upload all your cookbooks. So you need to actually get. So you need to get three cookbooks. <coughs> you need to get <coughs> Chef Client, Cron, and Log Rotate. Oh, okay. And those. We gotta extract those into the directory. Yeah. Directory. Yeah. Yeah. This is because we're not using Git in this environment. So instead of like making everyone download Git and install Git, this is like the poor man's way of dependency resolution. <laughs> the way so like the way you want to do this is you want to be using Burp Shelf, but like on a intro to Chef, hey, let's throw dependency management solutions at you and like a bunch of other stuff. It's just not useful. So now we've got these three recipes, or cookbooks, uploaded. Let me know when everyone's caught up and we'll continue. So I'm doing something else, so ignore what I'm doing for now.
So let me know when you guys have the cookbooks uploaded. When you have the cookbooks uploaded, what you need to do is you need to copy what's on the screen. Um, you need to go into your roles directory, and you need to go in and create a file, and I called it base.json, and then create this skeleton that's going to configure the, uh, the uh, chef client to actually run correctly. So there's a bunch of attributes that I'm, or two attributes that I'm passing in. So this is, we're creating a role and then we'll apply this role to our server. And we're overriding attributes in the chef client cookbook and we're overriding interval and we're overriding what's called splay. Interval is how often we'll run. And then splay is we'll run every 300 seconds plus or minus 30 seconds. So 270 seconds to 330 seconds. So the idea is that we put a kind of a random seed in there so that if everybody came up at once, we're not hitting the chef server all at the exact same time every five minutes. And then I'll show you where I found this information to like know what to put into this file. <laughs> it's funny, I, got, I signed up for a new Chef account, and so I got our welcome email. Need help with Chef? Yeah. <laughs> Which is all automated, right? So let me know when you guys have this. Some are faster typers than others. If you already have this, what you can do is save it and then try and figure out how to upload it to the server. So knife roll from file, file name. So let's talk about where we get these attributes from. You need to copy this still? Yes. Okay, sorry. I'll pause for a second. Um, so if I go and look at, in my chef server, I can see, it's not behaving the way it's supposed to. So you should be able to go into a cookbook. <laughs> I don't know why this isn't working. And you should be able to see um, all of its information here. And if the cookbook is written properly, so there's a readme.md, and you should write documentation so people actually know how to use and consume your cookbook. And that's shown in the Chef Manage console. Uh, it should also be shown, sorry guys, um, if you go to the GitHub repo for a cookbook or if you go to community.opsco.com and look at a cookbook, then you'll see that readme file there displayed as well. The other thing is you could tune this down to maybe like 30 seconds. And so as we're making changes, you can actually can pick things up quicker. No, sir. 
I modified this from another one, so it could be wrong. Shall I take off the Would this underscore? Yeah. No, that's supposed to be there. That closes that. Yeah, but it shouldn't matter. So there's two different ways that you can actually write this, uh, these roles. You can actually write them as Ruby code. You can also write them as JSON files. Um, the Ruby code is actually interpreted at when it's uploaded. So you can actually write Ruby in there if you needed to do something more complicated. And then it gets turned into JSON when it's actually uploaded to the server. Uh, the problem is, is that you can only then download JSON from the server. You can't actually download the raw Ruby anymore. Um, Mine appears to have worked. It was with a nice roll from file. It didn't get any syntax errors. What's the difference in yours? What? Sorry? What's the difference in yours? I just don't know that last comma. I just played. This is invalid JSON. If you're going straight to specification. Oh. Uh, I thought you said to get rid of a different comma. No, 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 just that one. Okay, so get rid of that comma. There you go. So there's a couple of different ways we can do this now. Let's do it through the console just for the hell of it. Uh, I should now see that role. And I can drill down into that role. And this is actually giving me an error because my, it says my cookbook's not here. But then I can also see my attributes. So there's the attributes that I defined. And now I can actually go to my node and I can edit the run list. And I can actually drag that onto it. So your run list should now look like this. Yeah, I And if you save the run list, then you need to go one last time, you need to go to the node and run sudo chef client. And then after that, it'll periodically check in. And if you made it 30, when you're done here, go back and change it. Because otherwise, you're going to be pounding our server every 30 seconds. It's not like we can't handle it, but 
<laughs> Just be nice. Yeah, so you can do it two different ways. You can edit there or you can pull down on the gear. Edit run list. And then drag server base over. So, so this is going to be executed in the way that you specify it, right? So kind of the way that we uh, suggest things get set up is, um, let me go back to what I was looking at earlier. So this is kind of a, an environment that we have. So I've got a whole bunch of different roles for this environment. And I have a couple ones that are kind of like the base getting started type roles. And so I have one called server base, and then I have Ubuntu base, and I have CentOS base, right? So if I'm running on a CentOS box, by default, I want to put in CentOS base. If I'm running on an Ubuntu box, I want to put on Ubuntu base. Then anything common between uh, uh, Ubuntu and CentOS, yes, there are some things that are common and that might be shared, you would use server base. So if I actually look at um, Ubuntu base, you can see what it actually includes is it the, the uniqueness is that it needs apt, right? It can't install that on a CentOS box, right? Then it sucks in the role server base, right? So roles can call other roles. So anytime I set up an Ubuntu box, I'm going to install this role onto it, and then it'll get server base. Whenever I do a CentOS box, I do CentOS base, and it's going to give me the only difference between Ubuntu, in this case, that we care about, is that one needs yum and one needs uh, apt. So it's basically inheritance for your configuration. Yes, yeah. So server base is something that's like very def like standard crap that needs to get installed before you can do anything else. In your run list, if you put it at the bottom, all that base level stuff that might need to take place before something else happens would happen at the end. So base type stuff like Ubuntu base, CentOS base, server base needs to go at the top of your run list. So you get everything set up the way you want it to, and then you have your recipes run to configure your application. Gotcha. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Now, if you run, if you ran Chef Client, did you guys run Chef Client on the node? Uh, since doing all of this? Yes. No. So run sudo Chef Client, and you should get a new recipe that's going to get installed, and it's going to be the Chef Client recipe. Why does it get this role now? Where does it get the role? Did you put it on the run list? I imported the rule to the shift server. Mm -hmm. and that's it. Okay, so go into nodes and then click on the gear and say edit run list. This is just another way of doing it. Okay. And then drag server base over and make sure it's before Apache. And save it. And then go run Chef Client. And so you should see a lot more output. Yeah. yeah. And what did you set your interval to? 30 seconds? Yeah, I'll update it to 3,000 later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. So now you should be able to see, like, if you go to the reporting console, you'll see it checking in periodically. The other thing is now go to your attributes. Either do a knife node show your node name and do a long listing, or go into the web UI and you can pull down attributes and you should see chef client there. And so this is an example of how the recipe is actually overriding. Yeah. 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 The other thing that you'll notice is that so when you do um your run list only says server base. When that's evaluated, it actually expands out. And so you'll notice when you do a knife node show, you actually get a long list of recipes. And this is actually 
the evaluated list from all of the roles that are actually running on that machine, right? And anything it depends upon and anything that's imported. So what's interesting is if we actually look at the Chef Client um, cookbook, So if I go into cookbooks and look at Chef Client, I actually don't do anything. I, in this default, it just says include recipe Chef Client service. <laughs> it's like one line, right? And so what ends up happening is I can actually kind of walk the chain. And now if I look at service, What it does is it automatically determines based upon where it's running and the node and what init style you said you wanted it to use. It actually will include recipe chef client, whatever this variable name is. And it includes yet another recipe, right? Because we have all of these different, we've done a great job of like consolidating down to like one init service. <laughs> Uh, so if you're running on, you know, Solaris, you need to use S uh, SMF, right? Or run it, or init D, or init, right? So depending upon where you're running. If you're running on Windows, you need to be able to run as a Windows service. So what will happen is, is this will get replaced in, and it will pull in yet another recipe. So if you look at your recipes line of your node, you'll see what recipe it actually determined it needed to pull in. I'm thinking it might have pulled in run it or init. Um. Looks like just a nib. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that's the default one that this gets set to. So if you wanted to change the init style because you use launch D, right? Because um, you're. I don't want to use that, but go, we'll go for it. I did that on purpose, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you would override in your role. Um, you would then put another attribute in there, init style equals one of these values, right? Yeah. And then the recipe would get pulled in correctly how to handle that. So it's like 4.30, so you guys wanna wrap it up? So like we're at a good place? Sure. The other cool thing that you guys should check out um, in the kind of the meantime is this Um, knife CS stack. So if you run knife CS stack, it's actually going to complain. But there's stack create, stack delete that you'll see here. And you can actually now, now you have a chef server, now you have a cloud stack cloud, you can actually build these JSON documents that basically allows you to define that I have this run list, I want, you know, in your case, server base, recipe Apache. And what'll happen is if you put this in as the JSON file that you want, it'll actually go and launch two web servers for you and um, automatically, and then automatically apply this run list to it as well. So something interesting to check out. Any questions? Can you send the slides? Yes, I will send the slides. Um, I'll, uh, Not sure. I think I, I can get the list of email attendees from Shabash. I'll just send it out to everyone. Thanks, guys. I have a couple of questions. That yeah, are, yeah, no. Not really, yeah. Other people may not be interested in them. No, go ahead. OK. Uh, one question is, uh, how do you manage, um, as far as the actual deployments go, when you're in uh, an environment like this, if you weren't using this 
chef manager, mm -hmm. would you be setting up like a chef instance that's in your cloud and then kind of executing from there with this like chef master? Yeah, so uh, you could, so if you have multiple cloud environments, right? Mm -hmm. The chef man, like the hosted part is nice because you get this one place to go, right? Um, or the alternative is you can install the exact same stuff in your data center. So you can either install the open source version or you can install the enterprise version, which gets you the pretty GUI of reporting and some other features as well. Or you can just install the open source version, which gives you a GUI and other basic things that you need as well. Uh, and so basically what you would end up doing is putting it into each data center or each location that you would need to, a separate chef server. And then ideally what you would want is all of your infrastructure code and source, source control somewhere, and then setting up a process to where the source control automatically syncs with the shop server. Okay, that was gonna be my next yeah. question, was how, are you, how do you pull your custom builds onto these? But yeah, so you, you need a separate- You wanna try and treat well. the, um, what do you call it, the, uh, the source control as the, sync, the source of record, the source of truth, and then your shop servers automatically get updated from that source of truth. Okay. By like, you know, yeah. Jenkins or whoever are doing it right in an automated way. Yeah, one of the CIs. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah, and then the other idea is that, um, I mean, the way Facebook does it is they just have a bash script that does it for them. Everything comes back to bash. Yeah, at some point. I mean, especially <laughs> like if you're not using a Ruby environment where you're writing the rails yes. and the builds. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. You gotta do something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but look at, so look at Berkshelf because it'll make your life easier from like a dependency management perspective. Yeah. And then there's hooks into Vagrant as well, so. Yeah, well that's the chef I played with was in Vagrant, but yes. it's kind of the opposite approach to learning it. Instead of really understanding chef, it was like, okay, we're gonna use Vagrant and then chef's gonna help us. Yeah. A couple small things. And then it's, in some cases that's chef solo as well, mm -hmm. uh, not using the chef server. Yeah, I think that's what I was using because I didn't yeah. have to do yeah. all the other configuration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So, yeah. so with the with the code, would that be a, to pull the code? Would that be a template as part of the service structure? What do you mean? Um, like if you were going to do, I, I would assume you would do a pull client side on the nodes that you deploy, so that node mm -hmm. would automatically go out mm -hmm. and grab from the the integration server. So would that just be a template well, that would cause that integration? The um, the pull, so the nodes themselves pull to the chef server. Okay. And then the chef server needs to pull down from the Git repository or okay, SVN gotcha. repository or whatnot. Gotcha. And the nodes continue to sync to the chef server. Okay. Because then that way you get the capabilities of search and things like that. That makes more sense. Yeah. One last question. No, that's fine. <laughs> um, how do you approach dealing with like a content distribution network mm -hmm. in the chef environment? Like, are there kind of pre-built recipes or cookbooks for that? Or so, what do, what are you distributing in the CDN? Um, well, like if just portions of the app are rendered statically, mm -hmm. and then you're pushing those out into the CDN, you have to link those to those dynamic buckets that are created. Mm -hmm. You don't know what those URLs are going to be necessarily ahead of time. You'll just know like the root of the bucket. Um, so. What I'm asking is just kind of like, how do you integrate that? Would that be the same style of thing where you're like setting a configuration that's getting passed out to the chef client? So that CDN endpoint, right? So I guess somebody needs to tell the chef client or the, the recipe what its final URL will be. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing like redirects or something, there's something called remote file. So it's a resource called remote file. And so if there's an artifact you need to download, you can point it to a URL and it'll download it. Okay. And so if the CDN is smart enough to where it's doing DNS redirects or something like that, then to get it to the right point, then that would be sufficient enough. The other thing that you could do is there's something called data bags. And so you could write out a data bag. Somebody could write out the data bag of where the current CDN location is or something like that, or whatever, whoever needs to use what, and the chef client when it runs can actually query that data bag to get that information back okay. of like this is where I this is my endpoint that I need to use today. Okay. And you could use a data bag for anything that you couldn't configure 
and not made the fashion inside of Shell. Yeah. So yeah. you needed to pull like database stuff that wasn't in part of a repository or a mm -hmm. script, you could do it that way as well. Yeah, so data bags are interesting in that data bags are just um, JSON objects. Okay. And so I've got a couple data bags, one for users and one for groups. And if I go into users, I have two data bag items. One is Bobo and one is Frank. And if I cap Frank, you can see that it's just data, right? So string data. And then that can be consumed and searched upon. So you would search for users, because users is actually my data bag. And then my query, I could query on any one of these fields to say, all right, search users and give me where the ID is equal to Frank. And that would return, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah. very cool. Uh, these are, and then these can be encrypted as well. So if there's password data or something, everything except ID will get encrypted. Okay. And then it will be decrypted at runtime on the node. Awesome. So common use cases like uh, database passwords or something, right? Yeah. Solid. That, Solid yeah. Like that. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you. Well, cool. Glad it was useful. Lost. Uh, 75% of the class. But. <laughs> <laughs> those, aren't, those are the ones that just can't hang. Oh, wait, was this recorded? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>